In the early 1900s, Ernest Rutherford concluded his now famous alpha scattering experiment. He showed us that atoms were mostly empty space. And if you and I and the world around us are made up of atoms, that means that you and I and the world around us are also made up of empty space. That sol solidity is an illusion created by the repulsion of electrons and the interaction of light and matter. While Rutherford sought to explain and answer questions about the structure of the atom, his experiments really revealed that there were more questions still to be answered. For example, what is it that holds the nucleus together? Inside of the nucleus are positively charged protons which should repel each other and the nucleus should fall apart. Later, a colleague of Rutherford's discovered the neutron, a neutral particle that resides in the nucleus as well. What is it doing there? doesn't seem to have any function whatsoever. The purpose of this tutorial is to try to answer those questions along with a couple of others. So we're going to take a look at the simplified model of the nucleus and if you continue to study uh, this area you'll find that uh, that there's more to it than uh, I'm trying to show here but this is again meant to be sort of a beginner's look at this. First of all let's imagine a very simple nucleus composed of really just two protons. If you put two protons together, mainly they would be repelled from each other due to their positive charge. This kind of repulsion is known as electrostatic repulsion, or ESR. It's the kind of thing you see when you brush your hair in the wintertime and it sort of all repels from itself and sticks up on end. Again, if you put two nuclei together like this, or rather two protons, they would repel. It wouldn't be stable. There's nothing here to really hold them together whatsoever. This was a big mystery to scientists for a very long time, and they, uh, for quite a while they sought some answers to this, and it wasn't until in the 1960s and 70s that they began to formulate an idea behind what was maybe at work. They discovered the existence of a new force of nature that was called the uh, strong force, and this force uh, resides only in the nucleus and on subatomic particles like the neutron and the proton. So both the neutron and the proton carry strong force. As the name implies, strong force is very strong, but its one weakness is that it doesn't act over a very long distance. It only acts over a very, very short distance, almost like a layer of tape or Velcro surrounding the protons. They help to keep them together, but only if you can squish them together overcoming that electrostatic repulsion. Now if you did that, as is diagrammed here, it turns out that the strong force would not be strong enough to overcome the electrostatic repulsion and this would not be a stable nucleus. We need to increase the overall strong force while we're not increasing the electrostatic repulsion. That's achieved by the neutron. The neutron is neutral but also carries strong force doesn't have any electrostatic repulsion so if we add that to our nucleus then we are increasing the overall strong force but we're not increasing any electrostatic repulsion so the first stable nucleus that you can create that has more than one proton has two neutrons in it and this uh, results in, in a nucleus that will stay together because the strong force is greater in this case than the overall electrostatic repulsion the result is one of the most stable nuclei in the universe, the nuclei of the helium atom. So, uh, at this point, you can kind of think of neutrons as acting as a type of nuclear glue. And in fact, in the 1960s and 70s, they theorized the existence of a tiny little particle that was called the gluon. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in later classes. Okay, so basically then you can get the sense of a, of, a, of a stable nucleus. So now we're going to take a look at a couple of scenarios that lead to an, an unstable nucleus. As you might have guessed, uh, if you have too many protons, you have too many or too much uh, positive charge, and that can lead to a scenario where you end up with a unstable nuclei. For example, in this diagram, if you look at the clusters of protons and neutrons, you can see areas where protons are gathered and they would be repelling each other. And uh, so 
uh, if there's not the correct distribution of these atoms, or sorry, these uh, subatomic particles, um, you can eject a tiny little particle that carries away positive charge. And that tiny particle in this case is called the alpha particle. It's diagrammed on the right side there. This will leave behind a smaller, more stable nucleus uh, that's shown there in the middle. Now, uh, on tests and quizzes, you, you need to uh, write out these reactions in the form uh, that we call a nuclear equation. And these are shown uh, in the little box uh, down below here. Um, so let's see if we can uh, try to figure out what's going on in these, this case. If you look at the diagram above, what you should notice is that the total number of protons and neutrons is not changing. We're shifting things around, but if you added up all the protons and neutrons that are in the alpha particle and in the, on the product side with the, uh, the, the more stable nuclei, it would equal the amount of neutrons and protons in the unstable nucleus. So if we look at our diagram, or sorry, the, uh, the equation that's shown below, we have a protactinium, which is Pa, and has 91 protons. Two of those protons are going to be carried away by the alpha particle. So that leaves behind a nuclei that will have 91 minus 2, or 89 for its atomic number. Once you've uh, determined the atomic number, you can pull out your uh, handy periodic table and look up what is atomic number 89. And if you do so, you should find that that is um, AC, and you can write that down in that, in that space. Now the next thing we need to do is figure out what's the mass number, and again, there is 234 total protons and neutrons on the reactant side, and we need to have the same number on the product side. That means that the AC will have to have an uh, atomic number of 230. All right, so let's take a look at the alpha decay of some radon. Uh, again, we'll work that out uh, the same way. Um, and if you take uh, 84 plus 2, that gives you 86. And atomic number uh, 84 would be uh, PO, or polonium. And then if you subtract 4 from the 220, you get a mass number of 216. So that's an example of an alpha decay. All right, let's take a look at another uh, type of decay that can occur called a beta decay. In order to understand this, we need to take a new look at uh, new neutrons and protons and consider uh, their structure. All right. Imagine we took a proton and we squished it together with an electron. What would the result be? Well, it turns out that the result would be a neutron. And if you think about this, it kind of does make sense since the a proton and an electron should be attracted to each other. And if you think about the attributes of a neutron, it's a neutral particle that has roughly about the same size or mass of the proton. So for our purposes right now, you can imagine that a neutron is the combination of an electron and a proton. Later, if you study this uh, to a greater extent, in fact, we'll even uh, talk about this in this class, but you'll find out that this isn't exactly what's going on. But at this stage in the game, it's uh, not a bad uh, little model to use. Okay, so it turns out that neutrons, when left alone, are not stable. They, they actually need the interaction of uh, protons near them to keep them stable. And a neutron by itself will uh, decompose. It'll eject that electron and revert back to a proton. When this kind of decay happens of a neutron, it's called a beta decay, or more exactly, a beta negative decay. So now we have the neutron reverting back into a proton. There's a number of ways you could show that, uh, but the actual nuclear reactions that are going on here uh, would be written like this. A proton is an H or hydrogen nuclei has a positive charge because it has no electrons, has a mass number and an atomic number of 1. If it combined with an electron, uh, the electron would be symbolized by an E negative, has a negative 1 atomic 
number. That's because when you combine it with a proton, it turns it into a neutron and has a mass number of zero. A neutron is symbolized by a letter or lowercase n, a zero charge, zero for an atomic number, and one for the mass number. When that undergoes a beta decay or beta negative decay, it reverts back into the proton and the electron once again. It's important that you understand this scenario that I've written here. Uh, otherwise, um, then the next uh, example I'm going to show you, which is beta decays, uh, won't make a whole lot of sense unless, uh, unless you have that picture in your mind. So uh, let's, un let's take a look at a, uh, a pretty important type of beta decay that happens with a radioactive form of carbon called carbon-14. Carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. If it undergoes a, a beta decay, one of the neutrons, shown in orange here, will change to a proton, and an electron or beta particle will be emitted at a high rate of speed. So what happens in this scenario? Notice that, uh, that the, um, the number of protons is increased by one, and the number of neutrons goes down by one, and uh, we reverted or changed that into a new substance, in this case some nitrogen. Let's take a look at a nuclear equation. So here we have some uh, polonium, 80, uh, which is atomic number 84 and 216. And if that undergoes a beta decay, again, we're going to be changing a proton, uh, sorry, rather a neutron into a proton. And that means that the atomic number is going to increase by 1, which is really kind of weird. But 85 plus negative 1 is equal to the 84. That's why we assign a negative 1 value for the atomic number of a beta particle or an electron. So once again, once we uh, determine the atomic number, we can look at a periodic table to get the symbol of the element here, AT. Now think about the, uh, the mass number here. What we've done is change one proton into a neutron. And so that means that the overall total protons and neutrons remains the same. It'd be sort of like if you're in a classroom and you have a certain number of boys and girls and we somehow magically change uh, a boy into a girl, the total number of boys and girls will remain the same. So in a beta decay, again, the mass number does not change. And so we end up again with uh, 216 for the, uh, the mass number on the product side. All right, so if bismuth undergoes a beta decay, we get an atomic number of 84. That's polonium, PO. But in this case, the isotope here is uh, 210. One last example to look at, and that is a gamma decay. Gamma decays are different from alpha and beta decays because gamma is not a type of uh, particle. It's a form of high-energy light. So what happens in a uh, gamma decay is you have a high-energy nuclei, uh, and uh, like we have here with some uh, polonium, that's indicated by a little asterisk. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not polonium, that's plutonium. Plutonium, which has a high energy, uh, and that's indicated by the little asterisk. And so what happens is this uh, emits some radiation, the gamma ray, and we result in still a plutonium nucleus, um, which is all the same except that it's uh, released some energy. Uh, let's take a look at another example. Suppose we had some tritium, a uh, high energy form of tritium, undergoes a gamma decay, and this results in an unchanged nuclei, except that uh, it has a lower energy. So nothing changes in the total number of neutrons and protons. So again, uh, remember that a gamma decay involves the emission of light and energy. There's no particle that's emitted, and therefore the mass numbers and atomic numbers of your products will remain the same. So I hope this is helpful, um, and it turns out that uh, what, I, what I'm illustrating here is, is some models that will adapt and change as we study this a little bit further, um, and uh, so this is meant to be sort of a simplified way of uh, getting your way through nuclear reactions and nuclear equations, and uh, the, the true story behind these is uh, something that's a, a little bit more involved and also uh, really, really interesting, so if, uh, if you find it to be so you might decide to
look into it quite a bit more.